Hey gang, welcome back to Big Board. So it's been an interesting weekend. I've had a chance to play a couple of different games this weekend and do some setting up and reading of some other things. And I've been uh, messing around with uh, this Crossing the Line, Arkham 1944, which is from, and I may mess this up, so Furor Teutonicus Games. It's a European company, if you couldn't guess. Uh, probably based somewhere in Germany. But nevertheless, I wanted to show you a couple of aspects of the game that I found very interesting. It's probably way too early yet to say whether this is an amazing game, a good game, a bad game, whatever the case may be. I can tell you it's not a stinker. I can tell you that much, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> there are a couple of there are a couple of dynamics or mechanics that that I think add some freshness to wargaming in general and let's have a look at a couple of those and see what I see what I mean see if I can explain it in less than you know 20 minutes and make it interesting for you so obviously World War II based because we're dealing with Aachen in 44 and historically that was a highly attritional situation a uh, very bloody combat on both sides and in order to reflect that there have been some things done to to make that uh, the way it is, uh, make the results come out in that sort of fashion is what I'm trying to say. So the first thing here is every turn you roll for initiative and uh, there's a DRM that's applied for that and you can see there it goes 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, whatever the case may be. And there's also uh, a DRM uh, for uh, interdiction which uh, the US uh, will get uh, that adjusts every turn but the U.S. will get to add one to their DRM, to their uh, DRM or to their initiative role. And so you, it start, the turn starts here, and whoever wins the initiative, it's flipped to the opposing person's side, the reaction player's side, and then uh, you'll ha have that activation. This is going to slide up one uh, based on how I'm reading it at the... Uh, the beginning of the next let me just bring it up here now I'm, I'm, I'm equivocating uh, so you either put the reaction player's side upwards and move to two yeah so you do put it onto two and then uh, if it's already on that then you move it up to the the next high number so what that does then is is try to show or try to give the opposing player an opportunity to win the next initiative so that they can move some guys all very cool. What uh, what will happen though is that it's in a cycle, which is uh, a a movement, uh, an activation of a formation through to the end of that formation. This doohickey is not going to go back to zero. This will never go back to zero until the basically until the end of the operations phase, which is all of the operations that are conducted <clears throat> for the entire turn. And right now we're on we're on. Uh, uh, 13th activation I think it was here actually and so what we what we do do though is when it does flip to the opposing players benefit uh, his initiative we flip it to the opposing team side and pop it on the two and it starts from there and then it goes up and up each time if the other if the other guy wins so you know you can have two or three activations if you roll high as the as the US or the German uh, you can actually get quite a few activations, but you're not obviously not going to get more than once you get to eight, a plus eight on the die roll. You're you're probably pretty certain of picking up uh, picking up the uh, the turn, particularly if you're the Americans, right? So that so that was an interesting mechanic. Well, I, I like that. Uh, the second thing that struck me as interesting, and this is not how you do it, so don't panic. This is the German forces, but since I'm playing it solo, I've got everybody's stuff on all on the on the one side. There's a track on the other side of the board for where these guys go, and I've got the uh, Germans uh, sitting up here and the Americans on the on the track. You each uh, formation is uh, capable of a certain number of activations in a turn, and they will receive a number, a variable number of action points per turn, sorry, per activation of their formation. And that's going to be driven by the number here. So if you're a seven and you roll on a D10 table, you roll high, you're going to get a lot of activations. You roll low, you're not going to get a lot of activations. Get down to the three, the two and three, 
you're not getting a lot of activations. You might only get one or two activations per, uh, sorry, uh, one or two action points per activation. So that now that now starts to show the the uh, I guess not the attrition, but the the weariness or fatigue of the forces as they've been going at it for these you know, indeterminate amounts of time. It's one thing I I don't like here is that it's it, because it's got this fuzzy time feature that it just turns, uh, which is meant to represent the the fullness of the campaign. It doesn't give you a sense of uh, the time, the dates, and, and things of that nature because you you could have you know. You get, I guess, 30 activations. Uh, so at the end of a turn, what happens? Well, the end of the turn, depending on where your uh, activation marker is on the form activation track, you're going to get, uh, that, that's going to be impactful because you've got to, you, as the Americans, you're going to get either five new activations up to your maximum whatever that was, which for most of them it's seven, but there are some that have five or four, sorry, there's some that have four, you might only get two activations uh, uh, extra, right? So let's say that I, I'm now on one, and if I don't activate again until the end of this turn, I'll get two more, and I'll go back up to a three versus my full strength, which was four. Uh, if, I, if I run this guy all the way down to zero, he's gonna get five back next turn. So that's not too bad. And if I left him at five and didn't move him the whole game, the whole rest of the, that next turn, he would pop back up to seven, who well, obviously wouldn't get more than seven. So it's important though, because not only is it the number of four times you get to activate your formation in the turn, it's also gonna impact the number of action points you're gonna get to do stuff. So what can you do in an activation? Well, there's a lot of different things you can do, but we're going to focus on just two things. Obviously, you can move, and each stack or unit costs one action point. And then the the next thing that you are going to want to do is fight. And fighting has uh, three three scales. There's there's uh, running a hasty attack, running a regular attack, and running a uh, prepared attack, and they all cost different numbers of headquarters points. Uh, headquarters points, act, action points. Uh, just as moving your HQ, which is another action that you can conduct, will also cost action points. So there's a lot to be thinking about and considering as you're rolling the dice, seeing what's going to happen, seeing how many act, action points you get, and it's going to make replay value pretty significant. Uh, the, the combat system, uh, so, so there's, that's, a, that's a whole thing, right? All the different actions you can do. Now, the other thing, uh, you can obviously try and undisrupt yourself as well. But the other thing that you can do that if, when you do do a combat is you're pulling, you're pulling a chit that has a variable uh, numbers, uh, a, a scale of numbers on here based on your effectiveness that's on the left-hand side, two, three, four, flip it over, five, six, seven, right? And you'll see there's multiples, and the multiples are hasty attack on the left-hand side, in the middle is a regular attack, and on the right is a uh, prepared attack, and that's a multiple of your combat factor, right? Now, if I'm a defender, they're going to be whether I'm disrupted or not, and I forget what the third thing is, but basically you can see that it's going to give you a multiple no matter what, even if it's only one. Uh, though I did see somewhere on one of these things, and one of the charts here has got multiplied by zero, and uh, I don't know if the, they meant to put just no effect there, because multiply by zero obviously equals nothing. But I'm sure that's not the case. But so uh, so this is interesting in that this this creates some variability in your potential attack values uh, because these these numbers are all different in here. There's a, a, a twenty or thirty different chits, and I'm sure there's a very tight band of of ranges that we can see here. We're about to get a huge storm in here any second. And I think that's it coming down now. Uh, so, so that in of itself is fascinating. And then you've got combat support and you've got uh, uh, anti-tank features and you also have armor features and they will net each other out and provide you with DRMs. While it's a 1D10 combat results table, it actually runs from one through 20 which is pretty interesting. Low numbers are bad and high numbers are great uh, for combat. Uh, and then it's obviously uh, mitigated by terrain type and things like that, uh, pillboxes and a light forest in a town, pillbox in clear and all that sort of good stuff. So some really interesting, uh, I would say smart, 
and thoughtful design features, beautiful map, beautiful components. The rules are actually very clear. I'm just trying to learn a couple of games all at once here this weekend, try and get through some things. And uh, it's, uh, the going has been slow and I'm having to do a lot of looking up. I think that's more a function of me than anything else. The charts and tables on this sucker are really well done. I'm very, very impressed with the, you know, the terrain effects and what what's a Zark, what has a Zark, and what doesn't, when the, when units do and excuse me do and don't have Zarks. So all in all, so far, very very interesting. And I just thought I'd check in with you on that. I'm gonna pop this up for you, and we'll talk to you soon. And look, hey, under 15 minutes, boom, I'm winning. Bye.